Well, I hope that despite the restrictions and lockdown, that you have all had a meaningful Christmas. 2020 may not have ended as we would have wished for, so here's hoping and praying that 2021 will be better, and with the vaccines on their way, it should be. Having mentioned prayer, please keep praying for all those who... Let's start again. Good morning. Well, I hope that despite the restrictions and lockdown, that you've all had a meaningful Christmas. 2020 may not have ended as we would have wished for, so here's hoping and praying that 2021 will be better, and with the vaccine on the way, it should be. Having mentioned prayer, please keep praying that we all behave over the festive period, and that our emergency services and the NHS are as resilient in the new year as they have been over the past nine months. Pray too for the politicians as they try to make the right decisions under almost impossible circumstances. And finally, keep praying for our congregation, which has been wonderful at supporting one another during the pandemic. Let's begin with a hymn which Christmas would be incomplete without. Away in a manger. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the great truth we celebrate at Christmas, the fact that in Christ your light shines in the darkness and that nothing has ever been able to overcome it. Despite hostility and rejection, the combined forces of hatred and evil, still the radiance of your love continues to reach out. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Thanks be to God. We thank you for the light that dawned in the life of Zechariah and Elizabeth, that transformed the future for Mary and Joseph, and that lit up the sky on the night of the Saviour's birth. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Thanks be to God. We thank you for the light that flooded into the lives of shepherds, that guided wise men on their journey to greet the newborn king, and that answered the prayers of Simeon and Anna. Always you are with us in life or in death, leading us through the shadows. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Thanks be to God. We thank you for the light you brought through the life and ministry of Jesus. Freedom for the captives, sight to the blind, healing for the sick, comfort to the brokenhearted, peace and conf after confusion, acceptance after condemnation, hope after despair, joy after sorrow. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Thanks be to God. We thank you for the light that illuminates our lives today and which leads us step by step on our journey through life. 
the lamp of your word, the beacon of prayer, the glow of fellowship, the tongues of fire of your Holy Spirit, and the living reality of Jesus by our sides, the dawn from on high. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Thanks be to God. Loving God, you came to our world in Christ, bringing life and light for all. Shine now in our hearts, and may the flame of faith burn brightly within us, so that we in turn may bring light to others, and in so doing, bring glory to you. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our reading comes from Matthew's Gospel and reminds us that the first Christmas wasn't a piece of cake for the participants then, either. The escape to Egypt. When they'd gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, Weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Amen. Christmas is the second most important event in the Christian year, second only to Easter. At Christmas, the church is often seen at its best. It's most attractive and appealing. More people come to church at Christmas than at any other time. So what is it that draws people to God at this time of year? I believe that the answer has to do with the birth of Jesus. There is something about the story of his birth that touches people deep down inside. Something that is almost beyond our comprehension, our understanding. It is as if hearing about his birth triggers some hidden spiritual response within us. And so powerful is that response that even those who have normally no time for religion are affected. The Incarnation, God becoming a man, is one of the most powerful and attractive events in the Christian faith. And therein lies a paradox, because the birth of Jesus is also a great stumbling block to faith for many people. Many cannot believe that a virgin gave birth to a son that God could take on human form and so they reject the whole package. For some Christians, it is an attraction. For others, it is the rock on which their faith perishes. So what is to be said about the Incarnation, the virgin birth? What do we believe about the special nature of Jesus' birth? Let's begin by looking at the arguments for and against a belief in the virgin birth. The main objection to belief in the virgin birth is that it is a supernatural event. In 2020, we know that it takes a man and a woman to produce a child. There is nothing supernatural about it. The early Christians, on the other hand, were simple people who did not understand the world around them or how children were made. And so they made up this miracle story because they wanted to show that Jesus was special right from the point of conception, not knowing that what they were saying was scientifically impossible. There are two major flaws in that argument. One is that it is scientifically possible for a virgin to have a child. Artificial insemination can overcome that problem. And while I do not believe that that is what happened to Mary, it does cast doubt on the scientific argument. The second flaw is that at least one man in the first century knew how babies were made. When Joseph discovered that Mary was expecting, 
he made plans to do divorce her. Why? Because he knew that for her to be with child meant that she had been with a man and that that man wasn't him. So to say that the writers of the New Testament didn't understand what they were talking about when they gave the birth of Jesus miraculous status is wrong. They knew exactly what they were doing. The question isn't really about whether you believe in the virgin birth, rather whether you believe in miracles or not. Is the virgin birth any harder to believe in than the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water or the resurrection? If you believe, I have said, as I said a few weeks back, that we must in our God who has the power to create the universe from nothing, then surely it couldn't be too hard for him to make one of his creatures produce offspring in this way. To dismiss the virgin birth because it is a supernatural event seems ludicrous if you believe in a God who made the universe. As is often the case, it's not the how that's important. Rather, it's the why that counts. Why did God choose this method? What lessons was he trying to teach us? The reason for the virgin birth is partly historical and partly theological. In the time of Isaiah, there was a prophecy that said, Behold, the virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. The virgin birth is the fulfilment of this prophecy. If Jesus was indeed the Messiah, then the virgin birth was one of the requirements. The theology comes when you remember that Jesus was there at the beginning of time with God. Therefore, he could not have a normal birth. He couldn't be created as you and I were created. The virgin birth is an attempt to show how Jesus could both be fully God and man. Having a special birth often pointed out those people who would do special things for God. For example, when Isaac was born, Abraham was almost a hundred years old. Samuel was born despite his mother being barren. The virgin birth simply points to the unique nature of Jesus. The virgin birth, whatever happened, is meant to show us that this child was special, different from every other child. What the virgin birth is really about is the role of the Holy Spirit. The emphasis isn't on the fact that it was a virgin birth, rather that it was a birth that the Holy Spirit played a unique part in. And if after listening to me today, you end up with a better understanding of the role of the Holy Spirit as a result about thinking of the virgin birth, then good and well. Throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was the source of God's truth for people. It was the Holy Spirit that gave Solomon all his wisdom and allowed him to rule wisely and justly. It was the Holy Spirit that gave Elijah the courage to stand up to the prophets of Baal and Queen Jezebel. It was the Holy Spirit that inspired men like Isaiah to speak to the people of Israel and to remind them of who their God was. Therefore, in the virgin birth, we see the Holy Spirit at work in a similar way. In Jesus, we have the one who is in the unique position to tell us about God. He tells us what God is like, what God is thinking, what God wants his people to do. The time of guessing is past. The time of certainty is here. No longer do we need to wonder if the small voice at the back of our mind is God speaking. Now we have Jesus. In Jesus we have seen the love, compassion, mercy and purity of God. In Jesus we have seen the true humanity, goodness and obedience to the will of God that man is capable of. Thanks to the Holy Spirit, Jesus can mediate between God and man and he can also be present with man. And all because God's truth has come to live amongst us, thanks to the work of the Holy Spirit. In the past, the Holy Spirit was also the one who opened men's eyes to God. Abraham had his eyes open to the possibility of a new land and a people of God. Moses had his eyes open to the possibility of leading his people to freedom from slavery. Nehemiah had his eyes open to the possibility of rebuilding Jerusalem's city walls. In Jesus we see the Holy Spirit opening the eyes of people to the truth about God. By looking into Matthew's eyes, Jesus was able to change Matthew into a disciple. Zacchaeus was changed from a fraudster into a generous man. Mary was changed from a prostitute into a woman of virtue. Sin leads us astray, ignorance blinds us, but through the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus, we can recognise the truth of God when we see it. 
The Holy Spirit is also the creative power of God. Without the Holy Spirit, there would have been no universe, no stars or sky or sea, no flowers or trees, birds or animals, and there would have been no you or I. When we see the Holy Spirit working through Jesus, although he doesn't seem to give them life as such, he does offer a new vibrancy to life. It's as if he adds energy and vitality to otherwise flagging lives. New interest and zest for life is found in everyone who encounters Jesus and hears what he has to say. Because the power he offers is the very power that created the universe at the beginning of time. In one sense, it is true to say that we are not truly alive until we allow Jesus to bring the power of the Holy Spirit into our lives. The final aspect of the Holy Spirit's work that is to be seen in the virgin birth is the recreative power. In Adam and Eve, mankind had lost something very special. They had lost the unique relationship between God and his creatures. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was able to recreate the human soul in a way that overcame the loss suffered by Adam and Eve. In the same way that the Spirit was able to bring life to the dry bones of Ezekiel's prophecy, so Jesus is able to recreate the soul that has died to God because of sin. The last point I want to make about the virgin birth isn't about Jesus. Rather, it has to do with Mary, because she too was involved in this amazing event. Like Joseph, Mary must have known the risk she was taking when she agreed to God's plan of expecting a child before she was married. And yet she trusted God more than she worried about what others would say. Nor did Mary worry about the future. What she would have said had she known the pain and upset that this child was to cause her. In Mary, we see an example of obedience to the will of God. That would be... Forget that. The final aspect of the Holy Spirit's work that is to be seen... The final aspect of the Holy Spirit's work that is to be seen in the virgin birth is the recreative power. In Adam and Eve, mankind had lost something very special. They had lost the unique relationship between God and his creatures. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was able to recreate the human soul in a way that overcame the loss suffered by Adam and Eve. In the same way that the Spirit was able to bring life to the dry bones of Ezekiel's prophecy, So Jesus is able to recreate the soul that has died to God because of sin. The final point that I want to make about the virgin birth isn't about Jesus. Rather, it has to do with Mary, because she too was involved in this amazing event. Like Joseph, Mary must have known the risk she was taking when she agreed to God's plan of accepting a child before she was married. And yet she trusted God more than she worried about what others might say. Nor did Mary worry about the future. What would she have said had she had known the pain and the upset that this child was to cause her? In Mary, we see an example of obedience to the will of God that we would do well to learn from. Too often we want, too often we want all the answers before we say yes. In Mary, we see that sometimes the right thing to do is simply obey and trust the Holy Spirit. So belief in the virgin birth is about much more than believing whether a virgin could have a child. It is about a belief that in the birth of Jesus, the Spirit of God was operative as never before in the world. That the Spirit is the one who brings us the truth about God. That the Spirit enables us to recognise that truth. That the Spirit is God's agent of power in the world. And that it can recreate a human soul when it is lost to God through sin. It is about learning to simply obey and trust God's Spirit when he touches our lives. All this we see in the man Jesus, because the Holy Spirit was at work in his birth in a unique way. This Christmas, as you celebrate the coming of Jesus, as you celebrate his birth in a stable, remember what it teaches us about the Holy Spirit and his work in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we have heard the good news of this season, the glad tidings of the birth of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and we have rejoiced in everything which that means. Yet we know that this message is not just for us, but for everyone. Your love for all the world, your concern for all people, your purpose without limits. Help us then to go now with joy in our hearts 
and wonder in our eyes, to share the love that you have shown, and to make known the great thing that you have done in Christ. May Jesus be born again in our hearts and made known through our lives. Through the words we say and the deeds we do, the love we share and the compassion we show, the faith we proclaim and the people we are, may his light shine afresh in the world, bringing hope, healing, joy and renewal. Grant that all may come to know you for themselves and so celebrate the news of great joy, your coming among us in Christ to bring us life in all its fullness. May Jesus be born again in our hearts and may be made known through our lives. In his name we go to live and work for him with joyful thanks and grateful praise. Amen. Have a peaceful new year and I look forward to seeing you all again when lockdown ends. God bless and keep safe. And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and evermore. Amen. We end with O come all ye faithful.